Today, um, the topic of today is uh, to study hidden Markov models. And like some people already uh, mentioned before, these were the models that played a huge role in the human genome project. Um, they're sort of the key model that's used in sequence alignment. Um, and they're also the models that are used for speech recognition. So whenever you use a speech recognizer, you're using one of these models. And as, as we will see, the gra um, going via graphical models, um, the, what we've been playing with now uh, so far in versus on, gives us a very natural way of dealing, um, of being able to understand how these models work and how they actually figure out what words you're saying given the waveform that they receive. All right, so, so today's lecture will cover these models. Um, I will show that yet again, it's the basics of probability, conditioning and marginalization that I'm using over and over again. I'm not introducing anything new. It's always the same two concepts. If I want a marginal probability, P of x, I sum over all the other variables, not x. And if I want to um, reverse statements, I use Bayes' rule, which is essentially a consequence of condition. Um, I will describe the HMM model with a simple example. And th then I will describe the model um, in greater generality. So um, you need to learn what the model is. And then you need to learn the two things we can do with these models, which are prediction and filtering. And I will define both of these tasks. There is one other task called smoothing, and that task I will leave it for the homework, for um, homework three. Okay. So I will introduce HMMs with a simple example. So imagine you have a toy robot, like that little guy there. And your task is, or shall we say, the task of the, the of, I don't know, what of I push or I dog. Um, I dog has to figure out whether you're happy or sad, okay? Because you basically don't want I dog to bother you when you're sad, or you might want I dog to come and play with you when you're happy, or whatever is the scenario. Um, and let's say that uh, iDog checks whether you're watching Game of Thrones, sleeping, crying, or doing Facebook. Okay. So it can make one of those four binary observations. Okay. So you're, you're either, uh, I, sh I should say, this, the, it's trying to figure out whether you're happy or sad. It doesn't get to observe whether you're happy or sad. Like imagine, all, all it sees is it sees you watching TV um, or um, Facebooking or one of the two other activities. So in this case, the observation is actually not binary, but the observation is four possible things. Okay, so the variable will take four possible values. Okay. So let's give these names. So the unknown variable is often known as the state. Okay, so I'm trying to estimate the state inside of your head, whether you're happy or sad. Um, all I get is some observations from you, and in this case, my observations are W for watching, um, S for sleeping, C for crying, and F for uh, Facebook. Okay? And I will get one of these observations, and so the task then will be for me to estimate probabilities like what's the probability that you're happy given that you're watching Facebook? Or what's the probability that you're sad given that you're crying? And so on. Okay, so, um, so that's the game. The robot is trying to determine whether you're sad or happy. There's always, we in the world of probability, it's not like you're absolutely happy or sad, but I only have a probabilistic estimate. Like, for example, if I am the robot and I'm trying to estimate whether he is happy or sad right now, um, I get some observations. In, in my case, I get to see his face. I might see his facial expression. Um, it's got a red t-shirt um, and so on. So I observe a bunch of signals and then I need to know whether he's happy or sad. Of course, I will never, in my wildest dreams, be able to put myself inside his head and know whether he's happy or sad right now because he might just be a very good actor and 
he's actually crying inside right now. His <laughs> girlfriend broke up with him a few hours ago. But I wouldn't be able to know that. So I can only make a probabilistic assessment. And that's why I need to use probability because you can always observe, you can never know everything for certainty. There's no way I can know for certainty whether he's happy or sad right now. All I can have is an estimate of how, how probable it is that he's happy. Of course, for, in order to be able to teach this, I've simplified this to a much simpler example. Um, but the same model, if I, once I introduce continuous variables and so on, the same model can be used to actually attack the real problem the problem of assistive technology, where we're trying to build robots that are trying to help people perform tasks more efficiently. Um, if you have grandparents who happen to be um, in you know, old age home, they might be struggling to do sim simple tasks like brush their teeth. And so one of the things that hospitals are very busy trying to develop um, is um, what they call assistive technology, which is sort of, is sort of robot technology, or whatever, that will guide you through the process of brushing your teeth. And this might sound really stupid, but it actually is. People will like grab the tooth, brush, brush, put it down, and then put toothpaste in it, and then put it back. And, and it's really sad when you watch the videos. Um, and we're all going to be there one day. So if we can improve the technology to help us brush our teeth or do other things that are essential to, to live, uh, this would be great. But let's start with small steps. Let's attack this very simple example first. OK, so that's a setup. And so we already have seen enough to be able to model this. So we probably would have um, a node x. And then we would say and that there is a variable y, which is the observations. Uh, we shade this node to indicate that it's observed. And so we know that in order to be able to compute um, p of x given y, which is the unknown, we would need a prior. And the prior would just be p of x, which will be a table with two entries, which might be, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.8, and this would be sad, this would be happy. Okay, so this is a distribution over x. And then we might also have a distribution of a y given x. So we might have p of y in other words, let me just make that clear. P of x equals sad equal to 0 0.2. And we might have a distribution of P of y given x, which might be, um, we have two x's and we have four y's. So we need a table with four possible y values. And for x, we have two values. So x can be sad or happy. And x can be, what was it, watching Game of Thrones, um, w, sleeping, crying, or Facebooking. <coughs> sleeping, crying, or Facebook. Okay. Now, let's assume for now, that these numbers are given. An expert told you that humans are 80% of the time happy and 20% of the time sad. Okay? For now, we're always assuming that these numbers are given to us. Okay? Um, later, especially toward the end of this week and next week, we're, gonna do, we're going to learn these numbers from just data, just from observation. But for now, we need to first assume that we have these numbers. Because uh, once we can solve the inference problem, the learning problem will be easy. And then the two will actually be intertwined. But first, let's learn to do inference. And then we will attack the more general problem. So given that these numbers are given, maybe we have now an expert. 
And let's pick an expert from the audience, um, guy up here in front. What's the probability that you watch Game of Thrones when you're sad? Point one. Next person, what's the probability that uh, you, uh, what was S? What's the probability that you sleep when you're sad? Point three. What's the probability that you cry when you're sad? Uh, eight. Eight. Oh, I can't have a point eight. I can't have a point eight. Point five. Okay, what's the last number got to be? Point one. Okay, because probabilities have to sum to one. This is a distribution of a y. Y is the variable. X is given. Okay, it's a distribution over Y. The four values, given any possible instantiation of X, the distribution over Y sums to 1. Okay, and let's pick some other. Uh, okay, I'm going to do now my own numbers. We get blue. When I'm happy, I definitely watch Game of Thrones. Oh, but I really like to sleep too. So let's make it 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, because I would rather cry than Facebook. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we have our model. This is not an intended anti Facebook ad. All right, and then I, then I can do stuff. Okay, because now I can say, what's the probability that x equal, and by the way, this probability, that has two values, two. Okay, because it's a distribution over x. You're either happy or you're sad. Okay, it's p of x given that you've seen a y. But it's really a table with two values that add up to one. So I might, for instance, ask, what's the probability that I'm happy given that I am um, uh, watching Game of Thrones. So given that Y is equal to W. And so that's equal to P of Y equal W given X equal H times the P of X equal H normalized by P of Y equal W given X equal H times P of X equal H plus P of Y equal W given X equal sad times P of X equal sad. Okay, that, that is Bayes' rule. All right, so the normalization constant is the thing that makes um, you sum over the two possible things that the numerator could be so that you get a distribution that sums to one. And what you can do next, and uh, I'll leave that as an exercise for you, all, all that's left is to read the numbers in the table and plug them in, and you're able to compute the probability that you're happy given that um, you're watching Game of Thrones. Actually, given that this is sometimes having some numbers helps, let's do the calculation quickly. So this would be um, W given X equal H. It's this guy here, 0 0.4. Probability of X equal H is 0 0.8. So this would be 0 0.4 times 0 0.8. And then W given X equal S is 0 0.1 and X equal S is 0 0.2. Okay, and does anyone want to calculate that? They have a calculator, so that's 0.32, roughly 0.32 divided by 0.32 plus uh, 0.02. 
0.94. Okay? So the conclusion is that if I'm watching Game of Thrones, I'm really happy. Okay? Which is absolutely true. Depends on that Okay. They're all good. They're all great. Um, okay, so that's um, if if you're a different kind of person like him, who <laughs> doesn't like Game of Thrones, he would probably put a I don't know zero point two over here, and maybe he would put zero point eight there, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> And so a different conclusion would. So you would, you would personalize these numbers to each person. So, and once the robot knows these numbers, the robot will be able to always know what's the probability that you're happy or sad. Okay. So in this case, the robot realizes that a priori, it believed with 80% probability that you're happy. But once it sees, uh, so little um, eye dog sees, okay, Nando is happy most of the time. Oh, but he's watching Game of Thrones. Wow, he must be really happy. So let me go and play with him. And Nando gets annoyed because he gets distracted from his show. Um, it's good HCI matters. Um, OK, but here we assume that we have this general prior, which is kind of artificial. I kind of like the observation model sort of makes sense. You can very easily build an observation model that says, what happens, how sad or happy you are, given all these different scenarios. But the prior of being happy or sad, that's a bit artificial. Go ahead. Um, let's, I just, uh, if sleeping has nothing to do with being happy or sad, then would it be 0.2 and 0.8? Or would it be, like, would the probability of, yeah, or would it be 0.5 and 0.5? Like, would, it, I mean, are you talking about the, the numbers inside the table? Or I'm, yeah, I'm saying, what does it mean if there's no, if given is the same as that? If given doesn't, there's no effect of it being given. There's no relation. They're independent. Then uh, you, you could still the uh, probability of being. <laughs> let me take that question offline. You could still. You could, this is the general, I'm giving you the general case. You can now come up with small cases where, you know, some, like, uh, some of these entries might be zero or so on, that will give you natural independencies. Um, but let's uh, tackle that after class. So those would be special cases. And, but it would still apply. So you, to convince yourself, you can just create your own numbers, plug in their zeros and so on, and derive base rule um, consequences of it. And, and then you'll see what it actually means. Um, go ahead. We lost all the red from your slides. Can you see if um, moving the connector helps? Oh. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if I can screw this in. Okay. That's better. Okay. So, however, sometimes what you don't, someone doesn't tell you whether you're happy or sad, but someone might what's the probability that you're happy or sad, but what might be more natural to say is that um, perhaps when you're happy, you remain happy, and when you're sad, you remain sad. Okay. So imagine that this robot, so you don't want this robot to be doing the same calculation every, you know, this robot will be doing the same calculation every um, let's come up with a unit of time uh, every hour. Every hour this robot is trying to figure out whether you're happy or sad and doing the calculation from scratch. But now, if the robot knows that you were happy for the last five hours, most likely you're still happy. People don't just are all, all like emo, happy, sad, happy, sad, um, and, unless they have a dysfunction. Assuming you're not bipolar, um, you probably um, when you're happy, you remain happy, so 90% of the time. And say 10% of the time, you go from being happy to sad. So now I'm introducing time, and I'm going to use x2 to indicate the time after, and x1 to indicate the time before. 
just like we did with the uh, when drawing balls from the arm. Okay, let's say when you're sad, um, you, you tend to stay sad. Okay, so this is basically saying that the, the state that you're sad, given that you were sad the previous hour, is 0 0.99. People who are sad tend to stay sad, people who are happy tend to be happy. So this prior now encodes how we over time feel or how, how my emotional state evolves over time. I might have also have an initial prior and that initial prior basically is more like what we had before which is how often you're sad and how often you're happy at the beginning. But now let's assume we're in this dynamical situation where every hour the robot gets an observation. And so what we really want the robot to do is assume that you're given a sequence of observations like you were watching Game of Thrones and you went to Facebook and you started crying. Okay? <laughs> I should ask you, how many of you think that this person is happy at this stage? <laughs> um, and so what we really want to estimate is given a sequence of observations at any point in time, and in this case the point in time is three, what is the probability that you're happy? But to know whether you're happy, it helps to basically keep track of all the observations you've had. Okay, because we're assuming that people don't change emotional status that often. And clearly, if you know the sequence, it helps. Because if, if over the last three hours you cried and cried and cried, chances are that you're sad. But if you're watching Game of Thrones and then you had a little cry and you got, went back to watch Game of Thrones, then maybe you were just watching, I don't know, like a really emotional part of Game of Thrones and you just cried. Not necessarily because you're sad, but because you, you were just so happy to see those dragons. Um, okay, so the sequence helps. All right. Let's now, instead of saying just for time three, let's be a bit more general. So now I'm going to introduce a time index, and that time index is going to be T. Okay, so T is going to denote time. And so our model now will consist of an initial model, which is a table with two values. It will consist of a table that tells you how you evolve in time, and that's going to have four values. That's what we just saw in the previous slide. How often you and of course it also has the observation model that we came up with which had two rows and four columns. So those are the four, the, the, sorry, the three objects that we have introduced so far. You have an initial state and then the, we can also draw this with a, this is where graphical models come in and really help us a lot because we can just draw a nice graph that illustrates these objects. Okay. So essentially you have an initial state, x0, it's an unknown variable. From x0 via the transition model, you transition to x1. And then before you transition, you make an observation which we shade to indicate that it's observed. Then you transition to another state and you make an observation white. And so on. So this graph will be increasing over time. Okay. And so if we just take say the first for two time steps <coughs> We have that the probability of x0, x1, x2, <coughs> y1, 
and y2 is equal to p of x0 times p of y1 given x1 times p of y2 given x2 times p of x1 given x0 times p of uh, which one am I missing? x2 given x1. So if you expand, if you use the rules which is of a graphical model is described by the probability of each variable given its parent. X0 has no parent so you just put X0. Each Y only has one parent which is the X corresponding to it. And each X has only one parent as well which is the preceding X. Okay, so the idea is you're in an emotional state, you evolve to another emotional state, and then you exhibit certain traits. Okay. And, and the point of writing this is to show that the only things that appear in these expressions are p of x0 which we have. All of these guys are just observation models which we have and we will assume that the observation model is the same for all time steps. Okay, so you have something that adds up to 1 here. <coughs> okay, so something like that. And each of those guys is the same. Okay, so P of this is for all T for all t. Okay, so it is true for t equal 1 and for t equal 2. We use the same numbers for each p of yt given xt. Okay. So, so by using that, then the only numbers I need to represent as whole graph over time are those numbers that I have there on the screen. Okay, so we only need 6, 8, 9 parameters. This is an HMM. <coughs> Questions? Why the hidden name in HMM? Yeah, I didn't hear you. Why the hidden part in HMM? Why hidden? Mm -hmm. Oh, because there are things, so the idea is there are things you can observe and things that you can't observe. So from the things you observe, you try to infer the things you can't observe. Just like the example I had before, I can observe things about him, but I cannot observe if he is happy. So I just try to infer in my head. This is an important thing. Um, newborns, there's a very nice uh, TED talk which shows like newborns, for example, are, or like three-year-olds are incapable of knowing that other people can have beliefs in their heads, and so they can actually not do the sort of reasoning that we do because they don't know that there is a state out there. Uh, I was just asking why the um, bottom uh, probability has eight uh, cells, like eight probabilities. Oh, okay. Um, that is because this is, X can be um, happy, let me make sure that I match it to what I had before, a um, can be sad or happy, and then Y, because this is the distribution of a Y, Y can be watching TV, um, sleeping, crying, Facebook. Okay, and and this is for sad, happy, going to sad, happy, and this is sad, happy. And what we're saying here is that the numbers for p of y1 given x1 are the same as the numbers for p of y2 given x2. Okay, Th that's what I mean by this symbol, which means for all t. Okay, for any t you always have the same model. You only have one model which is how you go from x to y and how you go from one x to the next x. Uh, the, on the left hand side of the equation, uh, I'm not sure I understand what the significance of that term is. Like, What, what does it mean, the poly of x not and x1? Like, what, what, are you, what, are you trying, what does that tell us in the um, This probability here? Yes. This probability um, is not going to, this is just the probability of the full graph, the full joint. It's not going to be very, you actually make a very good observation. This is not going to be very useful to us. 
what we really, we don't care about this of probability. What you really just care about is what's the probability of x given a sequence of observations. What you really care about is this quantity here. Any x in time given observations. And in fact, this is the thing that we will focus on. Okay. But this is just to make sure everyone understands what the model is saying. The model is just a graphical model. We have a graphical model that essentially has this tree, uh, has the, it's a sequence. And then instead of writing each node as A, B, C, D, E, F, which I would run out of letters soon, I prefer to just use X1, X2, X3, and X4 to indicate the X's as they evolve over time. Go ahead. So basically our current observation affects only our current state? Or That's correct. That's what this so graph is saying. That's like a big assumption for when we are modeling real world problems? Uh, it is, but as I will show you soon that that assumption um, is not, even with that assumption we can do a lot of very cool things. Also, once you learn to do this one, um, it's very easy for me to explain to you how to relax the assumption and do more interesting things, which I'll get to at the end as well. Okay, let's move on. So my goal is to compute x given a sequence of observations. Now, instead of writing a particular sequence like Price, Sleep, Watch Game of Thrones, I'm just going to be lazy and I'm going to introduce this notation over here. Y1 to T, that means T observations you've made up to time T. Okay, so before, for example, if we had observed cry, 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 um, we would have Y1 equal cry, Y2 equal cry, Y3 equal cry. In that case, T would be 3. Um, when I write y1 to t, what I mean by that is y1, y2, all the way up to yt. Okay, so I always use this notation that x1 to t means x1, x2, all the way to xt. So it's just Python notation because it's a lot easier to write the left hand side and the right hand side. A shorter notation. And it's very standard notation. So if you read a paper on speech recognition and so on, this is the sort of notation you need to do. Um, in finance, all of econometrics uses this notation. Okay, so your goal then is to compute P of X T given Y1 to T. But you want to do this for all T. Okay? So the idea is we make an observation. So you start with P of X naught. You make an observation, you compute P of X1 given Y1. You transition, you make another observation, you compute P of X2 given Y1 and Y2, and so on. So, in essence, you start with P of X0, an observation comes in, and you use that to compute P of um, x1 given um, y1 another observation will come in and you compute p of x2 given y1 and y2 which is equal to using my short notation y1 to 2 then y3 comes in and you compute P of X3 given Y1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. We're going to break this a little bit more into two steps called prediction and Bayesian update. But essentially, that's what we're, this is what we're doing. Every time we get a new observation, we recompute our posterior probability. Each of these guys, This is very important to keep in mind. Each of these guys is a table like this, right? Because it's always a distribution. The y is given. X is the random variable. So each of these guys that you're computing is a table. And the table tells you how sad 
or how happy you are. And you might start with 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, then you become really happy, and then hell breaks loose, and then you start recovering. Okay, so it describes over time your, whether you're happy or sad. Okay? And there was one hand up. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering, like you have on Y3, you have Y1 to Y3, all, all of them there. But why would that be necessary? Because can't you just derive that from Y2? Because Y2 depends on Y1, so why do you have to go up? Y1 does not depend on Y2. So let's go back to an example. Game of Thrones. The observations, so this is Y1, Y2, Y3. So if you're crying, and then there's Game of Thrones, and then you're crying, the, the Ys don't depend on each other. I'm not making that assumption. I'm making the assumption that your emotional state does depend on your previous emotional step. But what you're doing does not depend on what you were doing before. Okay. You might want to have a model where you do want to include that dependency, but let's leave that as an advanced topic, which is not really advanced, but let's deal with this case first. So my model is only saying that your emotional state depends on the previous emotional state. And my model says that what you do is a function of your emotional state. So kind of similar to this question, so your emotional state is dependent on your previous emotional state, but that previous emotional state is dependent on the previous observation, right? Yes. So we, so we get into this nested recurrence. And what we're about to do is how to compute that nested recurrence. Because okay. indeed, this is what it's going to do. As we will find out, you know, so so given all the observations you've had up to now, you're going to compute just what's your current x. Right, so you don't need to compute, you don't need to look at y2, y1 again, right? Well, you, you have them in memory. So assume that you, you have their, their effect is being passed to you. Right. Okay. The important thing is that, that this guy here, what the value of this guy will depend both on what you were in the previous step and it also will depend on the current observation. That's the key thing. Whether I'm happy or sad now, it depends on whether I was happy before and it depends on whether I'm watching Game of Thrones or, or uh, whether I'm crying. So essentially, my current state of mind depends on two things, what I'm doing and what I and what my previous state of mind was. And what this will do is it will allow us to combine both. Right. Um, so is it possible that, like, for example, data observations of Y3 would cause us to revise our estimates for previous emotions? Definitely the case. And that's, what, um, that's a problem called smoothing, and that will be in the homework. <coughs> OK, but let's go one step at a time. So the first thing is um, we're going to derive a recursion, which basically, so this is what I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume that I have, that I know this, and I will show you how I can compute this guy given that I know the previous guy. Okay, because if I can compute one given the previous one, then I can compute the next one given my current state and the next one given and so on. So I can keep a recurrence. So I start at p of x naught, then I get p of x1 given y1. Given that I know this one, I get p of x2 given y1 and 2. And given that I know this one, I get p of x3 given y1 and 3. So if I know the previous one and I know how to compute the new one, I basically can compute all of them. Okay. And we'll just simply assume that I have, um, so essentially we're doing induction, we're going to assume that we have a reasonably good guess of this guy. It will turn out that even if you have a bad guess of that guy, this will still work. Okay? Because you might start badly in the, with a bad estimate, but over time that estimate will improve. So even if you start with a guess that's not uh, uh, the best possible guess, you will still be able to eventually do well. 
OK, so we now need to do a little bit of um, algebra <coughs> to derive this. So let's assume that we're at the part of the model where we have x t minus 1, y t minus 1, x t, y t. In order to compute p of x t given y1 to t minus 1, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum over all possible values that x t minus 1 could take, which are either happy or sad. p of x t and x t minus 1 given y1 to t minus 1. Okay. I'm just, I've just done a trick of marginalization. I've added x t minus 1 and I sum over it to get rid of it. But this trick, however, will allow me to do the following. It will allow me to rewrite this as the sum over x t minus 1 of p of x t given x t minus 1 and y 1 to t minus 1 times p of x t minus 1 given <coughs> y 1 to t minus 1. Okay. I've used two rules so far. One rule that I used was that p of a given c is equal to the sum of a b of p of a and b given c. So this is marginalization but given a particular fact and I've used the rule that p of a and b given c is equal to p of a given b and c times p of b given c. Okay, those are the two rules that I've used. So it's basically marginalization and conditioning, but when you have something that's been given to you. So it's the, the rule still applies in that case. Now, now comes the really interesting part in the derivation. Xt, so this one I have, right? Because this, I'm assuming that I have the previous guy. So I have this little table of two values from the previous iteration. But there's other probability, and, and they do get scary with all these indices, but they're really just small tables that you'll see uh, in your homework easy to implement. That one is tricky because it has this dependency of y1 to t minus 1. But here is the trick. xt given xt minus 1, does it depend on yt minus 1? No. Exactly. Because given your parents, you become independent. It's outside the Markov blank. So we can drop this and we can rewrite this as a probability over x t minus 1 of p of x t given x t minus 1 times p of x t minus 1 given y 1 to t minus 1. All right, so we're done. We have a way that if we start with a small table and, we, and given that we have this other table, we can compute this thing. The rest is just plugging in numbers for any particular case. But we now have a way of going from x t minus 1 given y1 to t minus 1 to x t given y1 to t minus 1. So we're able to do predict the next x, predict what x will be tomorrow. So you observe a bunch of foreign exchange rates, y1, y2, y2, the foreign exchange rate at each date. And you might just be predicting the volatility of the market, and which is x and the volatility, and you're predicting what the volatility will be tomorrow given the prices you observe today. And this is done routinely in, in the stock market. We use the same models there too. Okay, the other step is we need to compute P of xt 
Um, okay, I'm just going to write, given I'm a bit short of time, I'm just going to write the rule. P of A given B and C is equal to P of B given A and C times P of A given C divided by P of B given C. Okay. So this is a generalization of Bayes rule when you're given a context C. So basically it's exactly as Bayes rule, you swap A with B and at the end of each expression you just put a C. And the exact derivation of this is in the Google group. Okay, someone posted a, phot a photograph there. Um, so I'm going to skip the derivation and instead I'm going to let the TAs go over this and their tutorials today and Wednesday. And I'm going to use that over here. P of x t given y1 to t is equal to P of x t given y t and y1 to t minus 1. So I'm just splitting y t. Next, I apply base rule, basically using a, b, and this guy as c, and I can write this as p of y t given x t, comma y one to t minus one, times p of x t given y one to t minus one. All of this over the sum over x t of P of the normalizing fact, which is just the sum over x t of everything that appears on top. The next step and final step is to make the following observation. When x is given, when x t is given, does y t depend on the past? No, because no, given your parents, you're independent of the past. Even your, your mark of blank is just your children, your, your partners, and um, your parents. So because of that, we can finally write this just as p of y t given x t times p of x t given y 1 to t minus 1. And then we just again normalize by x t. And the, the important things here is that we computed this in the prediction step. This we have because that's observation model. So given that we have an observation model and that we've been able to predict the state, we can update, we can compute this guy. And we're done. Okay. Yeah, but in the, in the previous, uh, in the previous slide, the prediction slide, uh, mm -hmm. there's. Yeah. So in the so prediction, the, for the prediction, I need this guy. Yeah. I have this guy, so I can compute the prediction. So I can compute this. What information do we need to have that table, where the one by two table? This table here. Yeah. Where you start with p of x naught, which is just two numbers. So you can get the next one. And you get the next one, so and then you get the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So you start at x1, so we, we do precisely what was in the sequence. We get this guy, then we get this guy, then we get this guy, and then we get this guy. But each of these steps is broken into two sub-steps, which is prediction and update. Prediction, update, prediction, update, and that's the HMM algorithm. That's the HMM filtering algorithm. And that's how you do it with speech. So just quickly now, before you guys go away, um, so if x could be an object location, like um, so x could be an object location, say observations that you're making an image, and then x is the location of the object, and you, this is what we use so that a robot can see where you are, 
the robot just gets an image, a video, and the robot tries to infer a latent variable, which is your x, y coordinates and the scale, um, and so on. Um, you have models that might have more variables, like for example, Mars rovers use this. They want to estimate whether their internals, whether the wheels are broken. They need to self-repair. So in order to self, because it takes too long to send a signal to Mars, you can't remote control. It would take half an hour and it can only be done in a window of two hours uh, to send your signal there. So the robot has to, given some observations, figure out whether its wheel is stuck or whether something is broken. Um, in speech recognition, you start with uh, sound waves and then there is a sort of hierarchical HMM where you start getting the phonemes and then you get words and then you can even get some syntax features whether like you have noun phrases or verb phrases. And then also in bioinformatics you might have, um, so in this case each, each of these guys um, could be a vector that indicates how much each gene gets expressed and then given how much this gene is expressed, you're trying to determine some, uh, some trait of the patient, how the patient is reacting to a treatment, for example. So these models are very widely used, but they essentially just involve those two very simple steps, prediction and update, and then you just interlace them. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks.